everybody. Welcome to this edition of Hardwired. Thank you so much for joining us. We hear a lot about revival these days. If you pay much attention to religious news, you will routinely hear people claiming to be in a revival here, revival there, revival everywhere. It goes without saying that America and the world need revival like never before. But what does genuine revival really look like? What are its earmarks? What does history reveal about true revival? What took place when God actually visited a place with a genuine, mighty move of His Spirit? And what were the long-term effects? In today's message, we're going to answer these questions. So may God send us the kind of revival that will shake the nations. I'm so excited to share part two of the message, what genuine revival looks like. Let's find out. Revival is something you hear a lot about in churches. We always hear about revival week. You know, one time a year, churches will have a revival. Nothing wrong with that. Although I do believe the church ought to be in perpetual revival. That's the way the first century church was. Now, I want to start by discussing with you what real revival is, what it looks like. How do you know that you're seeing real revival? What are the earmarks of it? How can you tell it's happening? Of course, usually you have to be pretty dense to not realize real revival is afoot when it is. But let me give you a couple of definitions of revival. Charles Finney, the great 19th century revivalist, defined revival as, quote, nothing more or less than a new beginning of obedience to the Word of God. Well, another man wrote, revival is falling in love with Jesus all over again. That's revival. Falling in love with Jesus all over again is no longer stale, no longer a used-to-be relationship, but it's fresh now. I'm in love again with Jesus. Having not seen him, wrote John, yet you love him. The dictionary defines revival this way, and I really like this, quote, Revival is a return or recovery to life from death or apparent death or from a state of neglect or oblivion or obscurity or depression. Revival is a return to what you used to be, where you used to be. I like this definition as well. Revival is a powerful intensification of the Holy Spirit's normal activity. Boy, I like that because that's exactly what I've experienced in the revivals that God has allowed me to experience, to watch with my own eyes. It is an intensification. Whereas a few souls were being saved, all, all of a sudden there's a flood of souls being saved. I like this definition as well. Revival is a powerful intensification of the Holy Spirit's normal activity. Boy, I like that because that's exactly what I've experienced in the revivals that God has allowed me to experience, to watch with my own eyes. It is an intensification. Whereas a few souls were being saved, all, all of a sudden there's a flood of souls being saved. Where the presence of God was very real in a service, all of a sudden it is overwhelmingly real. And people who were cool and cold and distant and sort of on the outside looking in get drawn in and pulled in by the power of the Holy Spirit. It is an intensification of the Holy Spirit's normal activity. Conviction of sin, righteousness, and coming judgment, the moving of God. Now what I've found is the word revival is not in the Bible. Not the word revival, but revive is found in seven verses. Revived, like in past tense, in six verses. And reviving is found in two verses. So the word revive is there, just not revival, but re being revived brought from near death or brought from death neglect oblivion obscurity depression people who used to be filled with zeal filled with fire filled with excitement for the work of god have now cooled they were at the church every time the door was about to open they were there waiting they couldn't wait to be in church anything that moved they were witnessing to it always in prayer always in the word red hot filled with zeal in what we would call the cage stage. And I wish we were all in the cage stage. They were excited about Jesus, in love with Jesus. You talk to them, you'd hear about Jesus in the first five minutes. 
But now there used to be. It's because something has happened. Some of them got offended. They got offended and never handled it, never forgave, never moved on. And so that offense wore them down and took away the life of their, their spiritual vitality. It might have been an offense or it might have just been some bad decisions, little things here and there, and they cooled off. It doesn't really matter so much why as what now. But they're used to these. They are powerful used to bees. Let me ask, did you used to be a preacher? Did you used to be a Sunday school teacher? Did you used to be a street minister or a prison minister or a nursery worker? Did you used to be somebody that was out there all the time handing out tracts and talking to people about the Lord? Did you used to be? See, I've learned a long time ago that what the devil is really after, he's after a couple of things I'm going to talk about today. One of them is our faith. He wants to affect our faith. He wants to attack our faith. And he's after our clear conscience. If he can take away the clear conscience, he can shut you down. He has many weapons he can use to stop a Christian who is filled with the Spirit and filled with joy and filled with Jesus and who is influencing their world. i got to be honest with you today. I'm very concerned about the United States of America. I've never been more concerned about this country in my entire life. And I know there is an answer. And the answer is the person of Jesus Christ. And guess where he is? Christ in you. The hope of glory. Christ in you is the hope of glory. And I know that if the church comes together in unity and begins to pray, and sometimes fast, and call out in the name of the Lord, and gets the fire back, and gets the zeal back, and gets the first love back, then there is nothing that can stop the Spirit of God cascading down like a mighty river all across this land. Oh yeah. But the service or ministries of many are dead or ready to die. Let me give you a fact. Sitting in a chair on Sunday mornings may involve worship. It may involve learning the scriptures, but it does not take the place of active service for the Lord. There is an anointing to minister on every one of you. Every person in this room has got a gift from God. And God doesn't want it to lie dormant. God doesn't want it to sit there and soak and sour. But God wants it active and alive. That's why our church is always looking to raise you up into the place of the work of the ministry. Because if I do it all, then all that's going to happen is what I can do. But if you get in the game, there is no limit. There is no end. I want you to say with me, I'm called. Well, that was kind of convincing. I heard from about 10 of you. Can you say it again? I am called. There is a gift in me. And somebody needs it. I guarantee you that's true. If you're in the used to be category, then you're a candidate for a revival. And something's going to happen to you in the next few weeks. I believe that if you will be willing... God's going to revive you. He's going to bring you from that languishing. He's going to bring you from that lethargy. He's going to bring you from that sleepiness and get you back in the game. Now, another thing that Jesus may have seen in this church is the devotional life of many was dead or ready to die. Now, here's a million dollar question. How was your Bible reading last year? Since we're in a new year now, how was your Bible reading in 2011? And did you regularly attend church? Well, Pastor Jeff, I went to church on TV. Let me tell you something about that. I thank God for television broadcasts, and that's great. You watch TV, but you know what? That TV image can't marry you, and that TV image can't bury you, and that TV image can't lay hands on you when you're sick or visit you in the hospital when you're in the hospital. That TV image can't visit you in jail. That TV image can't lay hands on you in this altar and pray for you. And guess what? No one that is in this room is there with you as you watch that TV image, and we need one another. There's nothing like coming together for church with the people of God. I love this. Amen. Turn your attention to what is dying but not yet dead and allow it to experience a revival. If today's spiritual fervor isn't what it once was, now is the perfect time to strengthen what remains. And then it might be also that Jesus saw their secret prayer life was dead or ready to die. Many Christians have no idea 
what a prayer closet is, or what a prayer list is, to make a list of what to pray for, or what it's like to pray for anything beyond, Lord, take care of we four and no more, amen. Or a flat tire prayer, Lord, I'm in trouble, help me in Jesus' name, amen. He's more than that. He wants to do exceeding abundantly above. He wants to bless you in ways you've never been blessed. He wants us to be in the place of prayer that he can share with us his secrets and his burdens. He wants us to fellowship with him. So it's time to draw near with hearts sprinkled with the blood of the new covenant. To draw near with boldness and boldly say the Lord is my helper. And boldly say, Lord, shake this nation, shake this city, shake this church, shake me. Amen, church. But another thing he might have seen is the steadfastness of many that was dead or ready to die. The Bible records of the early church that they continued steadfastly. That's the way the Holy Spirit described them. Steadfastly. In doctrine, in fellowship, in breaking of bread, and in prayers. That means communion and prayers. They were always in teaching, fellowship, communion, and praying. Pastor Jeff will be back in a moment. But first, I want to share a couple of thoughts with you. Now, you may not be able to stay with us for the entire program, but don't worry. You can find the program at our website, hardwired.org, along with all of the programs from Pastor Jeff. Also, we regularly get emails and calls from listeners just like you who tell us how much the program means to them. But we would love to hear from you, too. So let me encourage you to connect with us by calling 877-884-3111 or through the website hardwired.org that's hardwired.org or call 877-884-3111 and now let's get back to Pastor Jeff with the rest of today's program think about that they were saturated with God their holy habits brought them into contact with God in four different ways on a daily basis teaching, fellowship, communion and praying they could not get more than 24 hours away from God because this is what they did every day, teaching, fellowship, communion, and praying. They were steadfast. That means there was no way you could pull them off that holy center. They said, if you find me, I'm going to be in communion, I'm going to be in prayer, I'm going to be in fellowship, and I'm going to be listening to the teaching of the Word of God. I am Jesus saturated. I can't get away from him. He's above me. He's below me. He's around me. I have created the habits in my life to bring me in contact with Jesus on a regular basis. Now revival also brings not only life from death or almost dead, but joy out of despair. I love joyful Christians. And I don't like being around sour Christians. Can I be honest with you? They bring me down. I like being around people who are excited about Jesus. Now, I don't mean phony, and I don't mean fake, and I don't mean unrealistic. But I mean people who have got enough Jesus in them that it put a smile on their face. That they've got a positive outlook. That they know that God's got everything under control, even if they're in trials. And do you know that when revival falls, it is always accompanied with holy joy. Psalms 85 verse 6 says, Will you not revive us again? There's that word, revive. That your people may rejoice in you. Notice, revival brings rejoicing. The Holy Spirit in writing the word of God connected revival with rejoicing. I, I've said often here, if you've been coming along at all, you've heard me say the Christian's face is God's greatest billboard. A smiling Joyful Christian is the most irresistible magnet for Christ Jesus on earth. If you get filled with joy, they want to know where you got it. And when you tell them you didn't shoot something to get it or snort something to get it or drink something to get it, but it came from the Holy Spirit and Jesus, they want to know, are you kidding me? Are you sure? Oh, yeah. It's the Holy Spirit and His joy, and that's what keeps me alive. Because the Bible says the joy of the Lord is my strength. That's why I tell you, if you're all sad, and you look like you got baptized in pickle juice, and you've always got a furrowed brow, and you're headed to a restaurant after this service, don't tell them you were here. But if you go out of here 
with a skip in your step and a smile on your face and a gleam in your eye because the Lord is good all the time and all the time the Lord is good, then tell them you are here. Happiness comes from a happening. You get a new car, you get a raise, you meet somebody new, and you're happy because of a happening. But joy is not from a happening. Joy is from a relationship. Joy comes from the Holy Spirit. Joy comes from that well of salvation that was dug in you when you got saved. Joy is supernatural. Happiness is natural. We got joy. And when real revival falls, you'll see a joyful church. You will see a church that can't wait to get in the door. You will see a church that can't wait to get to church. People need revival if they're not joyful in church attendance. Listen to what David said. He said, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Notice he didn't say, I was sad when they said to me. I was glad when they said to me, what? Let's go to church. Let's go to the house of God. There are people that wake up on Sunday morning and they say, oh me, it's another Sunday. And some of them, the churches they go to, I don't blame them. Because they're dead, they're lifeless, they're religious, they're not delivering anybody, saving anybody. There's no moving of the Holy Spirit. But a church alive is worth the drive. If the church is alive, then you ought to be glad when they say, let's get up and go to the house of God. I feel like I'm about to preach today. Oh, church, listen. I'm not sad when they say to me, let's go to the house of God. I love being with the people of God. I love raising my hands with all of God's saints and worshiping the Lord. I love the life that I feel and the joy that I feel and the encouragement that I feel. I love God's people and I love being around them. And you ought to too. And you better get used to it. Because heaven's coming. And there's going to be people there that you didn't think were going to show up. And some people that are there are going to be shocked that you showed up. But we're all going to be together, black, white, yellow, red, every race, color, and creed. You better warm up now. Just warm up now. A revival will cause you to quit asking the question, when is this service going to be over? And start asking, how soon does the service begin? I can't wait. Revival also just restores joy in giving. It says God so loves a cheerful giver. When you realize you can't take money with you, and you're not going to be here for very long anyway, what a blessing it's going to be able to be to face the Lord and say, Lord, I didn't hold back, but I gave. And when I gave, it empowered the church to reach people. And there's people saved because I gave, because I gave. They were able to go radio, television, into the streets, keep the lights on. People got saved because I gave. You didn't buy their way in, but you made it possible for them to hear it. Revival also brings joy and laboring for the Lord. Paul said, I want to finish my course with joy. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. He said, I've received an assignment and I'm not going to finish it sad. I'm not going to finish it complaining. I'm not going to finish it griping. I'm going to finish it glad, filled with joy. You can even have joy in persecution, in revival. They were whipped severely. And it says they went out rejoicing. They were able to experience shame for his name. And what about new converts? Do you have joy when you see new converts being saved, people being saved? He that goes forth weeping, bearing precious seed, will doubtless come again rejoicing, bringing his harvest of souls with him. And when you're in revival, you're happy to stay after church for an hour and pray with people who are being saved. It's not an inconvenience. And I want to tell you, church, I believe in God that we're going to see so many people saved. We're not going to have room enough to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And then the last thing I want to share about revival, real revival, not only life from death and not only joy from sorrow, but when real revival falls, it brings freedom from bondage. I promise you, because real revival is the Holy Spirit falling. 
I've seen him fall in great power. Now the Holy Spirit is not an it or a thing, it's a person. He's a person. He, the Holy Spirit, he moves as he wishes. But when he moves in great power, remember that definition. Revival is the intensification of the normal activity of the Holy Spirit. When the activity of the Holy Spirit is intensified, you walk in and you're immediately touched by his presence. Sins are pointed out and you repent. You find yourself weeping in his presence and you don't know why. People out there beyond the building, I mean, he is a tangible substance. That is, when he's on a place, it's tangible. You can feel it. And it's like a hovering over a place. And I've heard people tell me that even when they drive up into our parking lot, people have driven up and begun to weep because the Holy Spirit touched them in the parking lot. Because he's a presence. He is a presence. Now the Lord is the Spirit, Paul wrote. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom from bondage. Shackles are broken. Spiritual bondages are snapped and their power is broken. The Holy Spirit can do in a microsecond what a counselor can't do in a year. Just like that in revival. <clears throat> See, many people that walk into a church walk in filled with fear. The Holy Spirit breaks things like that. There are Christians that are afraid to tithe. They don't trust God. Afraid to go soul winning. They don't trust themselves. They're afraid to join the church. They're afraid of commitment. They're afraid to teach a Bible class. There's fear on them. Fear rules them. Fear dominates them. Because something dominates everybody's day. Some Christians are in bondage to friends and relationships. They're afraid of breaking. Don't want to be rejected. Don't want to lose an emotional attachment. They're afraid to pull away from worldly friends. And their worldly friends are pulling them down. They won't pull away. So the friends pull them down. He that walks with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Revival frees people from these things. Some Christians are also in bondage to the flesh. They have no joy, no victory in their Christian lives because they're dominated by the lust of the flesh. Habits that have bound them for years and years, and they don't believe there's any hope. Let the Spirit of God fall. Let the Spirit of God fall. And I, I have seen people addicted to heroin, addicted to meth, addicted to alcohol. And one move of the Holy Ghost and something is broken and snapped. I'm telling you, church, we're not messing around here. We want to see God move. Well, Pastor Jeff, all this talk, you're kind of spooking me. There's nothing to be afraid of the Holy Spirit. Here's what you ought to be afraid of. Sin. You ought to be afraid of the devil. In the sense of, if you don't get out of his grip, he'll ruin your life. True revival brings life from death, joy from sorrow, freedom from bondage. You've